What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Pod Scum. This is the podcast where we dive into the deepest, darkest, murkiest waters with a plethora of legendary guests. I am, of course, your host, the numero uno scumbag, your bastard of ceremonies, Rex Ruger. That's Rex with three X's. You might also know me as AKA the King of Sleaze, AKA the Hair Metal High Priest, and most importantly, AKA Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. Take one look. Here we are, father and son, ruling the airwaves. But DNA testing is almost where we want it, and I will prove once and for all conclusively that that man is my father. But we already all know that you're looking at the son of glam, the front man for the band. Just smoked a few grams, got a million fans. I'm your ice cream man, Mr. Wap Baba Lou Baba Wap Bam Bam Shazam. Hot damn. Feeling good. And as always, everybody in the house is looking good. And that is, of course, made possible by. That's right. Enough said. Coming to you, as always, from the lush lavender lounge of love. Joined, as always, by my consigliere, consigliere, however the fuck you say it, my doorman, my head of security, my confidant, my friend, my sometimes drug connection, Mr. Keith Hernandez Puppet, a man who, when he speaks, I do hear it. And he's excited about today because today we got a fellow athlete on, Keith. And uh, this is, of course, the No Frills podcast. Why No Frills? Well, because you get plenty of thrills. And them thrills are looking at this beautiful face. Plus, I don't know how to give you frills. I'm a 50-year-old man, for God's sake. I get in here, I give you my shtick, tell you all about myself, and then pow. And today it's really pow because we got a guy coming in here that's known to deliver. And I'm not talking about music today. I'm talking about deliver. Knockouts, fisticuffs, all that shit. I'm about to put them up and I'm about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And he better answer my questions. Let me get a sip here. As always, I'm still on the uh, windshield washer fluid diet. A gallon of this a day and you are guaranteed to lose 100 pounds. In a day. But I digress. Because along with bringing you this kick-ass podcast, I also front numerous glam and sleaze metal bands up and down the eastern seaboard with my main focus on Love Sword. And I'm still looking for players, motherfuckers. So if you're interested and you want to be the backing band behind the second greatest front man to ever do it, get with me. Take your shot. Take your shot. Show me what you got. But today we're going to chop it up with a former boxer. That's right. For my fans out there that don't know, and we have had boxers on here before, it is my favorite sport. Love me some fight game. As a matter of fact, there's my guest hitting me up right now. So let's chop it up and get in there, man. What do you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is he? Where is he? All right, I don't see him yet. There he is. What's up, champ? I can't hear you. You got to activate the microphone. What's good? There he is. There he is. How you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm good. I can't complain. How was the fu oh, f first of all? <laughs> let me let my let my audience know the great Ivan Mighty Robinson, uh, a guy that knows how to use these a lot like I know how to use these. Maybe not quite as good as you, champ. But I mean, uh, uh, how, first of all, man, you uh, we 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 talked earlier, man. You attended the Gervonta fight last night, did you not? No, I stayed home. You stayed home. You stayed. You yeah. know what, man? I gotta say, man, when I watched the weigh in, man, I didn't think he looked that good. Who, uh, Javante? He didn't look so hot, man. I don't know, man. Maybe I was sleeping on him a little bit. He didn't look like he was in great shape, and he looked a little, I don't know, man. 
Uh, he looked good to me, but then his again, performance you know, he was just, good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just went good. through that. You, you know, he just went through that ordeal with him being locked up and all that. Yeah, yeah, that takes its toll. That takes a, now. Now, you being a former fighter, uh, uh, I'm I'm glad you brought that point up. Uh, when something like that is going through your mind, uh, how, uh, how much can personal stuff uh, uh, affect you in a fight? And it can affect you a lot. Yeah. Really can uh, have you thinking some crazy stuff. Uh, you're yeah. supposed to be focusing on the fight, and you're yeah. focusing on what just happened. But uh, he did a good job, man. He was ready. Yeah. Now, uh, now you have shared the ring with uh, some very notable guys, uh, uh, the great Julio Cesar Chavez, of course, Jesse James Leha. But the one, but 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 the one fight. Well, actually, two fights uh, that I really want to focus on is, uh, uh, and I want my audience to know, you're looking at a guy who beat the great Arturo Gatti, the blood and guts warrior, for fuck's sake. I mean, come on, man. Not yeah. once, but twice. Yes, sir. Twice. Now, uh, talk to me a little bit about the late, great uh, Arturo Gatti, man. Uh, what was he like inside the ring? Because obviously he was known for uh, as a guy that liked to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe in there and really battle. You guys back in 98 were uh, the fight of the year, your first fight. Yeah, that's crazy because um <clears throat> excuse me. Um he was um <clears throat> he was promoted by main events. Right. Um I didn't have a I didn't have a signed contract with main events, but main events got all my fights. Yeah. And when um when Pernell was getting ready for uh Delahoya, yep, and he was getting ready for and I and he he was getting ready for Delaware, and I was getting ready for Philip Holiday. Or mm -hmm. Joe Gaddy was in camp with us. Yeah. Um. And me and Gaddy grew a real good relationship. This was before we even before they even thought about the fight. Right. He was champion. You know, I was coming up. I was a uh, twenty and zero. I can't remember what a turtle record was, but I think he only had well, he only had one loss because his second and third losses came from me. Yeah. So you know, we was in camp. Uh, we ran together. We ate together. We stayed up at night. We talked. We never even thought about fighting. Right. Um, it was just crazy that we never sparred each other. He yep. always sparred somebody else. And they, unfortunately, at that time, they had me in camp with Purnell for De La Hoya. I was okay. getting uh, I was getting Purnell ready for De La Hoya. Um, yeah, we was in camp there. I was also in camp with, uh, uh, my, what's my man name? Uh, Hey, the uh, the sumo guy. I can't think of his name right now. But um, we was in camp with him, and I was also in camp with Robbie Pender. So okay. you know, we know, we know, we always ran together. We got up like five in the morning. We did our little five mile. We came back. We ate breakfast. Then we went to the gym and we and we worked out. He worked out on one side. I worked out on one side. He sparred somebody else. I sparred Purnell, and that's just how it was. Um, it just so happened um after I had lost to Philip Holiday, uh my manager got me two wins right back to back, like within a four month various. Um mm -hmm. and Orto Gay had just fought um uh Gabriel Ruelas and got beat by Gabriel Ruelas. Yep. I mean, he knocked out Gabriel Ruelas. At that time, they didn't know who to get for Arturo Gaddy, they didn't have nobody in line. I had just fought. I was trying to get back to uh, getting another title shot or fighting somebody caliber at the time. At the time, Shane Mosley was the champion. And right. I was really trying to fight Shane. But for some reason, our um, our team wasn't, they, we just wasn't on the same page. Yeah. So they was looking for uh, a Gaddy fight. It didn't come along. So messed around. Shane Mosley was coming to Philly to defend his title. He was getting ready to fight somebody. So what happened, the day of the press conference, I went down to the press conference, and I interrupted the whole press conference, and me and Shane went at it, and I told Shane that he coming into Philly to fight somebody else. Why not fight somebody that lives in Philly from Philly? So yeah. me and him got into it. Um, me and his promoter got into it, and his promoter called Main Events, and Main Events made the fight. But what had happened, I had a fight about six weeks before that. And when me and Shane Mosley made the fight to fight each other, 
I went right in the gym and started training. But what happened, the fight before that, I had got cut. Mm -hmm. And we tried to, you know, make sure the cut wouldn't reopen to get ready for Shane Mosley. But the cut reopened. So I had to pull out the Shane Mosley fight. And I was already mad because I wasn't fighting Shane. I didn't know who I, who was there for me to fight. My manager couldn't get nobody. I think main events really wasn't trying to push me as much as they was with Gaddy. So I guess what they did, they messed around and they was like, yo, let's make Ivan and Gaddy. And <clears throat> i never forget it. <clears throat> I was in my house in the room and my phone rang, and I picked up the phone. It was my manager. So my manager was all excited. He was like, Ivan, I got I got um some interesting news for you. So I'm like, all right, what's the deal? He like, I got a fight for you. I'm like, dang, about time. God is great. So I was like, well, who to fight against? He was like, Arturo Gay. <laughs> I was like, what? He was like, yeah, um, they want you to fight Arturo Gaddy. I was like, are you serious? He was like, yeah. I was like, I don't take down no fights. I'm from Philly. I don't care. I fight your mom if I have right. So I was like, right. all right, well, go ahead, make the fight. And the fight was made. Um, you know, uh, honestly, I knew I could beat him. I think my manager and my team was kind of really suspect about that fight because we all knew Getty was guts and guts and blood fighter. No doubt about we that. He, we know he can punch, and we know that um he was just gonna come at us. But I just knew I was a better boxer. Yeah. So I made yeah. the, we made the fight. We went right into camp. And man, we just start working hard, man. And um the fight was made. Um, I remember um like three weeks before the fight, we had a, a press conference in New York. Um, I rolled up to New York with my uh manager and my my right hand man. We was in, in the at the press conference. I was sitting here, Gaddy was sitting over there. Of course, you know, they had me go first. So I was just like, you know, Gaddy's a good fighter. Um, I spent time with him in camp, um, and I'm glad that he took this fight because I had nobody coming up. So, you know, I'm going to go out there and do what I do, and I'm going to beat him. Why did I say that? He got the podium next. He was like, Ivan, I'm going to knock you out. Yeah, You can't beat me. I'm the bigger puncher. And then something he said stuck with me the whole time. He was like, you can't bring knives to a gunfight. So I'm sitting there saying to myself, like, what is he talking about? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we, we uh, had the little uh, stare off, stare off with the uh, reporters, and then we left. So as I'm getting in the car to ride back to Philly from New York, I asked my right-hand man, I was like, yo, um, what did Gaddy mean by bringing knives to a gunfight? And I'll never forget it. He's My man turned around and said to me, it was like, man, you got to be the dumbest guy in the goddamn world. I'm like, what are you talking about? He like, man, what Gaddy mean is that, man, your hands is like knives. You ain't going to do nothing but cut him up. He's the puncher. He got the guns. He's going to knock you out. Yeah, yeah. That, that stuck with me the whole time in camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so uh, when you think about the Mosley fight and it falling through, is that something, that, uh, you know, that you look back on like, uh, you, you know, oh, man, if only that had come through? Well, far as – um. That's a good question because nobody. I mean, it's a big you know. it's a big opportunity, obviously, and at the time it probably would have been uh, very lucrative for you financially too. Well, it might have been, but then again, it might have not, because um, I'm thinking if I would have fought, get I mean, for Shane Mosley, you figure at that time when I fought Mosley, I mean, when I fought Gaddy, I had just lost to Philip Holiday, and the reason I had the Philip Holiday shot because I was number one. By yeah. the IBF. Yep. Shane Mosley was like number two or number three. So when I lost, he jumped up to number one and yeah. he beat he beat uh Philip Holiday and he became champion. I can't really remember what number I was, but they wasn't gonna pay me that type of money that I wanted or I thought that I deserved to fight Shane Mosley. What happened, I think taking the Getty fight, the first fight, I didn't make a whole lot of money. Of course, I knew I wasn't going to make a whole lot of money because I was the underdog. Right. The second fight was a very lucrative fight. I made a lot of money. I think I made more money than I would have made than I made with that that I made with Gaddy. I think I made that much more money than I would have made 
if I would have fought Shane Mosley. Right. Because they wouldn't have gave me that type of money, that money for Shane Mosley. Um, and then also the way I look at it, no disrespect to Artur Gaddy, even though we fought each other, he was still like a brother to me. Yeah. I made twice as much money the second fight than I did the first fight. Yeah, yeah. And then I think that paled me through my career to make the the the, the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar fights that I was making after beating Gaddy the second fight and fighting guys like uh Angel Man Freddy, uh Jesse James Leha, uh uh what's my man name? Uh Antonio Diaz. Yep. yep. You know, I, I start making and then fighting Chavez. I made a whole lot more money after beating Gaddy and being a known fighter than I think I would have made fighting Shane Mosley for a title. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, when you look back at the resume, uh, you know, and and you may, and, you know, forgive me for not knowing this, you may have been asked this and it might be out there as public record, but of all these guys on your resume, uh, in your opinion, who was the toughest fight? Say that again. Who was the toughest fight in your career? Um, well, I'm going to say the toughest fight in my career was because I was young at the time. And I was right on the point of that, like, uh, either get sunk or fly high. It was the right. Gaddy fight. Um, yeah. Gaddy was the one who, like I said, Gaddy was the one beating him and fighting him on HBO. And HBO giving me the recognition that I need. I think it, pat it catapulted my career. Because I, yeah. I really started fighting a bunch of great guys. Some people you may say I shouldn't have fought. But honestly, I think every guy that I fought, I could have, I could have beat. I didn't beat on, on what occasion, maybe because right. I didn't do enough in the gym or maybe they was just that better that day, but I can't, and I won't take anything away from my career. But my right. career was excellent. I think I had a great career. No question. No question. Um, when you think about being, uh, you, 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 you know, eating, sleeping, and 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 thinking boxing all the time, and you think of the hours that have to go into it, and you know, you hear about guys starting at young ages, you know, five, six years old, seven years old, you know, living in the gym all the time. Then you see guys like Jake and Logan Paul come along. What do you think of these gimmick fights that are kind of happening? You, you know, do you put much credit? Ability and, and and you think it's unfair that boxers, you know, I mean, who train their whole lives and just hope for some big paydays are kind of getting pushed to the side for these type of fights? Well, you know, that's a good question because that was a question that was an argument um about three days ago. I did another podcast uh -huh. and uh, we were talking about that. Um, you know, um at the time that I came through was was I guess you could say it was the golden years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, now is like water. It's watered down boxing. Um, I don't like the way that things are being done, but I mean, who am I to say anything about it? I mean, this is this is the world. This is how how things are being done nowadays. I mean, I don't like the fact that um, <clears throat> you have guys like Jake Paul. I, to be honest with you, besides him doing what he's doing. I actually don't think he ever put on a pair of boxing gloves and know what it is to really be a full-time fighter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying agree. And yeah, I I really do think that um some of these fighters are being uh jumped over, being sidestepped, going going around, then and not getting they do. But I mean, what can we do about it? Right, right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, what fights does boxing uh, have to have coming up this year, man? Well, what fights do we need to see that we haven't seen yet? Obviously, there's a lot made about um, Spence and Crawford. Are we going to see that fight? Um, you, you know, there's a lot of fights out there, great fights that could be made. I, obviously, we're talking about Tank Davis. You know, him and Ryan Garcia have been going to fight for a long time now. Are these fights that, that, that have to happen to resurrect boxing? Yes, I believe so. We need yeah. these fights. And um, <clears throat> I wish we could go back to the days, and I know you know these days because you there with me around around that time. I wish we could go back to the days where it was just three world titles and everybody and they mom or their sister, their brother trying to get a shot at the title. That's yeah. where you would know that who the great fighters are 
and let these fighters fight each other. You know, like the Crawfords and the Spence, uh, the Boots and the and the, uh, the 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 the, the Spencers and the Crawfords, the Jerron Ennises and the Sedolas, all these guys, man. Tank yeah. Davis, Tank Davis and uh, uh, Crawford. I mean Crawford. I mean, dang. Ryan so Garcia, Garcia Davis and uh, Ryan Garcia. Yeah, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see Ryan Garcia fight either uh, Shakur Stevenson or um, Devin Haney, and I want to see Tank fight the opposite one of them. And actually, I want to see them four fight on the same card. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, that'd be and great. Have, you know, have a have an elimination bout. The whoever wins on each side, that's who fights, and the losers fight the losers. And now we've seen a lot of guys uh, uh, at advanced ages come back. Uh, is it anything that you've ever entertained? You're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're done. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. And you can say yeah. that with absolute certainty. No comeback. Yes, for yeah. Yeah. Okay. Never. Fair enough. Fair and enough. If you, and if you hear it, if you hear it, you got the right to call me and cuss me out. Yeah. Really? Okay. I'm going to hold you to that, man. I'm going to hold you to hey. that. Yeah. Well. Do you think sometimes, though, that some of these guys, man, because uh, uh, I recently just heard on, uh, I believe it was Mike Tyson's podcast, where uh, Oscar De La Hoya said that, you know, without having fights uh, or something to train for, that retirement to him is absolutely miserable. He hates being well, retired. Well, it is, I'm not going to lie. It is miserable. I mean, I have fighters. I have a couple good young prospects coming up now that I've trained, one that I manage. And it is kind of uh, uh, mind-boggling. It does get to the point that I do want to get in there and uh, show them things that I know that they can do. Right. You know, it's in your blood. It's in your blood. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, I, I, I call myself, I run a block and it's a wreck. <laughs> so that I'm not doing that. Now you fought De La Hoya in the amateurs. Uh, was that ever a fight that you wanted in the pros? Yeah, well, actually, um, I can't remember what we were. I, I'm gonna just throw it out there. I'm not sure. I think I could have been like ten and zero, and he could have been like thirteen and zero, fourteen and zero, something like that. Yeah. And um, remember when he fought Julio Cesar Chavez? No, no, yes, my fault. Yeah. No, no, not not Chavez. When he fought Jesse James Leha? Yes, yes. I was I was the one he called first to fight. We wanted the fighting, but he outpriced us. He didn't want to pay us the money that we thought that um we should have got. He turned around and gave the money that we wanted. He turned around and gave the money to Jesse James Leha, not Jesse James Leha. Yeah, which I don't think would which I don't think is as good a fight as the one that you guys would have had. In no, my opinion. Would've. We would have we would have definitely had a, a great fight. I mean, because for one, we fought each other three times. I I think I think I'm not sure. I don't want to be all 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 uh, skeptical about it, but we knew each other from the three fights. But I think I got a little better because um my game had gotten pushed to a different level because my dad took me to a different level. Then I had Bowie Fisher, that was another great trainer who trained Bernard Hopkins. Legend. So, yeah. Yeah, I was I I was at that point that it was either a do or die situation with me with my career. And I think that fight would have definitely been a fight that I could have won. I want to I want your opinion as a as a Philly guy. Uh, you know, and so many great boxers come from Philadelphia, but why? You know, and I mean, like, why does does the city of Philadelphia just breed so many good fighters? What is it? I mean, we know that it's a tough town or whatever. You know, what I mean, but but you know, how come so many great fighters come out of there? I to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you that. I mean, if you ask me why, me myself, because I had put myself on a pedestal. I came out around the time that Melchior Teller had just won an Olympic gold medal, mm -hmm. and um. We never sparred each other, but we was around each other a lot. And I felt though that I had to be better than Meldrick. He was also with main events. So with main events looking at me and me feels though that I was a great fighter, I just felt though I had to do more than what Meldrick was doing at the time to be great. And right. I think it helped to a point. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when, when, you know, obviously the magazines and the boxing media makes a lot about this. Uh, I don't know how much stock boxers actually put into it or how important it actually is to boxers, but it is an accolade that gets thrown a lot around a lot, but pound for pound right now in the boxing world, who is the pound for pound best right now, in your opinion? You mean right now in this day and age? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think Crawford's at the top of a lot of people's list, but it's debatable. It is. It's very debatable. Um, the the two that I have, you can you can flip flop it either way. I'm gonna go with um, I'm gonna go with Spence. I'm gonna go with Bud Crawford. <clears throat> I'm gonna go with uh, <clears throat> Jerron Ennis, uh, Tank Davis. And I'm gonna go with Shakur Stevenson. I guess I'm saying with the small guys because yeah. I was a little guy. Yeah, you right, know right. I fought 135 my whole career. As an amateur, I fought 125. So really, anything going over 40, I'm not really. I mean, I know a lot of fighters in right. all weight classes, but I'm always prone to the small guys. I love the small guys. Now, now, obviously, uh, the flip side of that, you know, as you mentioned, all time greats, you always hear in all these sports, the goat talk, greatest of all time, greatest of all time. Uh, who is it for you in your mind? I know I've watched recent interviews and, 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 and seen you quoted as, as having extremely high regard for sweet pea. Obviously he's, he, you know, he's a guy that you, uh, admire a lot. Uh, uh, but, but, but who is your, who's the goat in your mind? Sugar Ray Robinson. All time. Yes, sir. Yes. No doubt. Yes. No doubt. But what was it though about Sweet Pea though? Because you've come out in a lot of interviews though, and really put him up on a high pedestal too. What about it was? Uh, what about him? Uh, uh, made him so great. He was he was special, as people say about uh, Bud Crawford, yeah, Jerron Ennis. You know, Sweet Pea was just special. It was just. He was, I mean, he was just special, man. I mean, and with me, and no, I take no credit away from myself. I was a bad dude myself, but I felt as though nobody could beat me. And at the time that I was training with Purnell, I felt as though I was a bad man. He he put me in my place. He let me know that I wasn't better than him. Yeah. He let me know that I couldn't hit him when I wanted to hit him. I only hit him when he let me hit him. <laughs> so, you know. Purnell was just special, man. He was just that. He was just that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the all-time greats for sure. Now, now, you, you know, obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, top of the interview, we were talking a lot about Artero Gaddy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, he's no longer uh, with us. A lot of controversy. A uh, very polarizing topic about if the wife had much to do with it. You know, what I mean, yeah, if it was actually. Good. If it was actually a suicide, where do you stand on it? Obviously, he was a friend. He was a brother type figure to you. Uh, do you have an opinion on on what happened to Arturo Gatti? And do you think he's the kind of guy that would have taken his own life? No, he never would have taken his own life. His wife took his life, and yeah. I always I tell everybody this. I mean, even though we fought, and I beat him because it was it was it. In that situation, it was a do or die situation for me. Not right. for Gaddy, because evidently, after I fought Gaddy, he went on to fight, I don't know however long, and he still was able to make millions of dollars. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And the kid, well, I ain't gonna call it, well, he's a kid, yeah. He, uh, he had a lot of money, you know what I'm saying? He had a lot of real estate. So he did a lot of things great with his money before he passed away. So, you know, hats off to him about that. But, in that case, man, um, Gaddy wouldn't have never took his life. I understood that he, you know, he had some flamboyant ways about him, like he would get drunk and, you know, he sure. would act a certain way. But, I mean, everybody has their flosses, what they do when they're not around their people or their family or whatever the case may be. But I could never, ever really say that Arturo Gaddy was a disrespectful guy or he was uh, – he was, I mean, he was loved. He was loved yeah. all over the place. He was. I mean, this man was absolutely loved, man. And he would take his shirt off his back for you if he knew you like that. 
Yeah, that's the type I get of guy that. he was. I get that. Yeah, I, I kind of get that vibe. You know, like just from not knowing him personally, but just you know, reading stuff about him, seeing him in interviews, he does. He does certainly come across as that kind of guy. Uh, when you see somebody like a uh, um, a uh, a Floyd Mayweather, you know, go around and you know, obviously, you just mentioned Sugar Ray Robinson. It, uh, it, you know, in your mind, the all time great, and I think he'd be the consensus with a lot of people. Uh, w- when you see somebody like Floyd Mayweather or some of these other guys go around and stake their claim as being the greatest, you know, and he's put himself above a lot of those guys, including the great Muhammad Ali. Uh, is that just like stuff that boxers have to do? Is it just talk? Do all boxers have to go around and just kind of, you know, pump themselves up and say that they're the best? Is Floyd being kind of delusional or is that, is that something that he has to say because he's Floyd? That's a great question. Um, There's no doubt there's millions of boxers in the world. Um, And of course, you when you start doing this and you really get into the, uh, the way of doing it and how to do it and how you got to go about it, of course, you kind of pump yourself up by saying, I want to be the best. Right. At doing whatever you do. I don't care what your mom and dad always teach you that you always want to be the best at what it is you do. Right. And I mean, I think that's what Floyd actually fed off of is him being the best because of what he did and how he did it. And I take nothing away from him. his dad trained him. So he's supposed to love the fact that he feels though he's the best because his dad trained him as well as I do too. Cause my dad trained me. But at the same time, I mean, you gotta be realistic about it, man. I mean, I come through the through the era that Floyd come through. I'm I'm not that much older than Floyd. I might be four years older than Floyd because Floyd came. Floyd was in the '96 Olympics, and mm-hmm. I just was making the '92. So we're not mm-hmm. that far apart, you know. Floyd, you know, he just took a different he took a different route about it. He was smart about his money. He's a he's a great businessman, um, and he do magnificent things. But far as himself calling himself the goat. I can't see him calling himself to go. He hasn't done the things that Sugar Ray Robinson did. Look, first of all, let's not even talk about Sugar Ray Robinson. Let's go back to talk about Jack Johnson. Right. Yeah. Things Jack Johnson accomplished in his life. And, yeah. you know, I think Floyd, the only reason why Floyd going around saying he's the best, because he don't have a loss. I understand that. But you got to understand, back in the days when Sugar Ray Robinson and them guys, for they used to fight the same joker 20 times. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So yeah. that's to me, that's what makes a guy like Sugar Ray Robinson a goat. Because my thing is this: if that's the case, I might as well call myself the goat because I don't beat I, I don't beat Ochoa Gaddy twice. Right. Nobody ever beat him twice. So right. why not call the goat? You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it is what it is. But you know, um, I don't think he's the goat. Um, I told you, I think Sugar Ray Robinson is the goat. I agree I, with I, you. And, and the thing of it is, it's crazy. I'm not really a big Muhammad Ali fan, but I, I think Muhammad Ali was a goat too because Muhammad Ali did some things in boxing that not even Floyd could have done or right. even tried to do. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Um, and of course, I'm from Philly, so you know I love Joe Frazier. Oh, no yeah. Doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I, Me too. I, I, I don't think I could be on your podcast and people see this and I couldn't mention Joe Frazier. You got to mention him. You got to mention him. Yeah. Him. I mean, one of the greatest of all times, man. And, 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 and even though, and, and, and I think Muhammad Ali tried a lot in those, in, in the lead up to those fights with Joe Frazier, you know, to paint Joe as the villain. But I think now that the smoke is all cleared, though, it was pretty evident that Muhammad Ali did a, uh, threw a lot of the gas on the fire. It was pretty mean to Joe. Exactly. exactly. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, you know, and not showing him a lot of respect. You know, I think Joe gets painted, you know, as more of the, uh, you know, as more of the bad guy. But it's, it doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, because, I mean, like, you can you can look at, at that situation in two snares, like when – Muhammad Ali took that break and he was trying to get back. Yep. And when they took his title from him, you know, and, and the word on the street is or in the world was that Muhammad Ali didn't have no money. Joe Frazier offered Muhammad Ali money to fight. Yep. Try to get Muhammad Ali money to take care of stuff, things of that nature. Then you come to my situation, like with me, when I was fighting, when I lost to Philip Holiday, and I was looking for a fight. 
nobody wanted to fight me. But yeah. Gaddy took it upon himself to step up and say, look, I'll fight you. Yeah. Now look, we got, we got guys like Bud, Earl, all these guys don't want to fight each other. For what reason? What's the purpose? What? Because y'all guys don't want to lose y'all. Oh, that's what it still seems to be. be. Yeah. Nah, it's crazy. I mean, yeah. when I was coming up, guys had 11 to 12 losses, got shot set titles, and become champion. Look at my man, Freddie Pendleton. He yeah. was like, he was like 11 and 34 or something when yeah. he got a title shot. You well, know, I, mean, for, so. I mean, I mean, for God's sake, Irish Mickey Ward had 12 losses and they made a fucking movie about him. <laughs> I, ain't that crazy? You get Mark Wahlberg to play you in a movie and you got a dozen losses. That's pretty good. <laughs> yes, it is. Really you know? good. Yeah. Hey, I mean, listen, man, it's been a real honor chopping it up with you, man. I, you know, I love how honest you are. I love your slant and your take on boxing. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, you know, it's been a, just a real pleasure talking to you, man. And hopefully we can stay in touch. And, uh, next time something big Definitely. is cooking in boxing, we'll get on here and do it again. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. And guess what, man? The Giants are going to the sucking Super Bowl. Your fucking Philadelphia Eagles can suck it, man. It's not happening this year. It's you not happening. Funny. It's not, I, no, I, I, well, listen, first of all, I don't think today's game is going to be a big barn burner because it looks like both teams are really going to be resting a lot of their players. So, right. You know what I mean? So, I, you know, we both made it into the playoffs, man. And uh, your Eagles look tough this year, though, man. They look tough. They look legit, man. Yeah. They look legit. I hope, I hope they don't. Uh, I hope they don't break. See, I'm, I am an Eagles fan, but then I'm not an Eagles fan because they, they let me down all the time, man. I don't yeah. like to be let down. I know, I know. <laughs> well, listen, champ, it was great talking to you, man, man. And, uh, you know, uh, happy new year to you, man. And, uh, you know, Thank all you. the best to you, man, going forward, dude. And we'll talk again soon, man. Okay, thanks, buddy. Thanks, Mighty. Talk to you soon, brother. All right, all right, all right later. Champ. Later. Bye. There he goes, folks. The great Ivan Robinson, former IBF lightweight contender. And, and a fucking guy who beat... The legendary blood and guts warrior, Arturo Gaddy. You heard him, man. Ain't nobody beat Arturo Gaddy, man, like that, man. Back-to-back -back times like that. Plus, he shared the ring with uh, the great Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. Not that pussy junior. No, Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. has got to be dying of shame. Burying his head in the sand at his boy. But, but, uh... My man right there, Ivan Mighty Robinson, fought Pops. Fought Pops. Also shared the ring with Jesse James Leha, Vivian Harris, Antonio Diaz, Angel Man Freddy, Oscar De La Hoya in the amateurs. That's a legit brother right there, man. Right out of Philadelphia. We're only the toughest, toughest fucking boxers come out of. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode of Pod Scum, man. That was a hard-hitting one. Fast and hard-hitting, man. And uh, listen, man. Until next time, I want to remind y'all, keep, see, man, I'm smoking too much weed. I can't even get my own catchphrase right here, Keith. Remember, y'all, take it easy and keep it sleazy.